Today's podcast of Hellben for Horror is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash Hellben for Horror. Audible has over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Hi, and welcome to Hellbent for Horror, a podcast devoted to all things related to horror. I'm S.A. Bradley, and I'm a lifelong movie lover, but my heart belongs to horror. My biggest thrill, however, is getting to talk to people about this stuff. I really want to start conversations with you. I had mentioned before that I'm not a fan of labels, like the word genre. It's a way to categorize art by the style and techniques used to tell the story. But more often than not, that simple categorization is used more to separate movies from each other in level of importance. Nobody ever says drama genre. In fact, you rarely hear anyone even use drama. It's just film or novel. As if a certain style of storytelling is the pure form and everything else needs a warning label. And you can see the warning label mentality in full force if you look at Silence of the Lambs. In 1991, Silence of the Lambs became only the third film in Academy Awards history that swept the top five categories at the Oscars. The movie features cannibalism, severed heads, intestines, and not one, but two serial killers as main characters. Kinda sounds like there's more than one stylistic flair you'd find in a horror movie. Yet you'd be hard-pressed to find horror movie used to describe Silence of the Lambs psychological thriller is always used to describe it. So what makes Silence of the Lambs a psychological thriller, but Hitchcock's Psycho or Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer horror films? All three movies use real-life serial killers as their inspirations. In fact, Silence of the Lambs uses at least three. So what's the difference between these films? I'm assuming it must be those five golden statues. But an odd thing happened after Silence of the Lambs became the first psychological thriller to sweep the Oscars. It essentially killed horror films for the entirety of the 1990s. We ended up with a decade-long glut of boring thrillers. It's ironic that the movie that got the closest to legitimizing horror styles into the mainstream gave birth to the longest drought in horror films since the silent era. I bring this up because I believe Turnabout is fair play. I believe there are movies that are considered dramas and thrillers that are really horror films in disguise, no matter what the label says, because those movies reflected and exploited the anxieties of their time just as much as any horror movie did. Now, a little clarification here. Even though all of the movies I'm going to bring up have human monsters, they fit my criteria of what makes a movie a horror movie. First criteria. Does the movie evoke horror? Does watching it give you feelings of dread, fear, or shock? And secondly, why does the film give you feelings of dread, fear, and shock? What's the reason that the film wants you to feel that way? In each of these movies, the filmmakers make the conscious choice to use visual imagery and tone that would inspire a sense of dread, fear, or shock, even if the subject matter isn't traditional horror fare. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. Let's take two films that came out around the same time that discuss the same topic, Oliver Stone's Platoon and Stanley Kubrick's Full Metal Jacket. Both movies are ostensibly about the Vietnam War, but they have very different tones and very different things to say. Platoon feels like it could be a documentary, which makes sense. It's based on Oliver Stone's actual experiences in Vietnam. Stone directs this as a pretty realistic, gritty, and intense narrative. The message to Platoon is summed up by the tagline that's on the movie poster, the first casualty of war is innocence. In other words, war is evil and it corrupts good men. Kubrick's Full Metal Jacket, on the other hand, has a very different message. Just take a look at his poster. The tagline is written on a helmet, born to kill. In other words, there's a killer in every man and war is where the psycho comes out to play. 
Stone's film is, for the most part, hyper-realistic. Kubrick goes for a more surreal, expressionistic approach. He distorts reality through the camera with abstract framing. We only see the disorienting world he wants us to see. He also distorts reality through the story. We only know the insane world he wants us to know. There's no backstory to the vicious drill instructor, he just is. There are no warm scenes of male bonding like there were in Platoon. The closest to male bonding we get is when we see Crazy Earl, one of the Marines in the Lust Hog Squad, sharing a beer with a dead Viet Cong soldier next to him. Crazy Earl makes a toast. These are great days we're living bros. We are jolly green giants walking the earth with guns. These people we wasted here today are the finest human beings we will ever know. After we rotate back to the world, we're going to miss not having anyone around that's worth shooting. Kubrick isn't interested in innocence. He's interested in the killers. And we only see how killers get made. Nothing else exists. Kubrick uses that distortion of reality to add a masterful horror sequence to his movie. Actually, I think it's scarier than anything in The Shining. It's a psychotic break of private pile, played to perfection by Vincent D'Onofrio. The sequence takes place in the latrine, lit only by silver moonlight through the windows. The only special effect is D'Onofrio's face in close-up and that stark lighting. The sequence looks like it could have been in a silent F.W. Murnau film. It is monochromatic. You can turn off the volume and still know what's happening. That sequence is pure expressionist horror film. Now, I'm not saying that Full Metal Jacket is a horror film per se. I, I think it's more satire. But I use it to show how I read films. However, I do say that John Borman's Deliverance is absolutely a horror film. I know, every guy out there just said, yeah, for that one scene. And yes, that scene can't be ignored. But the way the story is told and the visual images we get make this a horror film to me. Deliverance is about four Atlanta businessmen who take a final canoe trip on a river in backwoods Georgia that is about to be destroyed to build a dam. Before we see a single shot, we hear mocking laughter from Ned Beatty's character Bobby. He's mocking Burt Reynolds' character Lewis for his overzealous environmentalism. Then we see a flooded valley with treetops poking out of the water. The laughter continues. Then we see a ripped up mountainside on a construction site and we hear warning klaxons. The mountainside explodes. Soon we see the men driving to the mountains with their canoes on the jeep roofs. When we finally see the mountains, it's not on a welcoming sunny day. It's dark and stormy. We hear thunder rumble. Now, this setup is as old as the first campfire stories. Beware of what is in the woods because the others are out there. The others are a stand-in for whatever the tribe fears. The others in deliverance are hill people, people cut off from cities and even towns. The first time we see a hill person is at a ramshackle gas station surrounded by rusted junk. The place seems empty and Bobby makes condescending jokes. He doesn't see the shadowy figure far in the background, slowly shamble towards him from behind the building. We finally see that it is a toothless old man in dirty coveralls. He is also a stoic and unimpressed by the city boys. We meet more hill people in the famous dueling banjo sequence. All the hill people we meet are either vaguely threatening or deformed, mostly both. The banjo playing kid is made to look inbred. The boy and Drew played by Ronnie Cox, they bond briefly over the music. As soon as the music is over, so is the bonding. The boy refuses to shake Drew's hand as if he were cursed. And that's the extent of what we need to know about the Hill People for deliverance. From here on out, everything is threatening in the movie. Locals tell men that if you go to the river, you get in there, you can't get out. They can't even find the river. The men keep driving into dead ends. Even the woods are telling them to go back from where they came from. As the movie goes on, the forest gets tighter around the men, and the camera shots get claustrophobic. 
Characters are always photographed next to fallen trees or heavy brush. The sunshine is blocked by the tree canopy, so they are always in shadows. They are boxed in, trapped. And you feel it too, especially at the most famous sequence in the film. The rape sequence is true horror. Ed, played by John Voight and Bobby, go ashore. They are surprised by two hill people. The hill people are armed, and Bobby and Ed are not. The threat builds slowly. The dread grows. We feel how helpless and alone these men are at this moment. And it's at this point of the film where Deliverance becomes a full-fledged horror movie. Ed is tied to a tree by his neck with his web belt. He's unable to look away from Bobby or help him. The initial attack on Bobby looks a lot like high school bullies cornering the fat kid, and Bobby acts like it. He's frozen in place like he's reliving a nightmare he thought was long over with. The taunting is sadistic, surreal, and perverse, and it starts getting physical. We are watching an adult turned into a child, and then something worse. Ed looks over to the river, and he sees the rest of the party paddling past them. But the hill person with a shotgun has it pointed at him, so he can't scream. The hill person gives Ed a broad smile that is missing the front teeth. The attack and the rape go on a long time, and the shock is profound. Just when the rapists are about to do at least as bad to Ed, the rest of the group comes to the rescue. Lewis shoots the rapist with an arrow, but the one with the shotgun escapes. This leaves our group fearing death at every bend of the river. The mountain has now become a big haunted house. The scenes also get more disjointed and mysterious, like the death of Ronnie Cox where the men are canoeing down the river to escape. He just suddenly shakes his head like he's dizzy, and then he falls out of the canoe. Director John Borman intentionally keeps information from us. All we know is that a main character just died without any explanation or buildup, and we are in shock. And nobody just dies in deliverance. The bodies fall in grotesque ways, forcing you to look at them. When the rapist is shot in the back with an arrow, his body falls on a tree limb, face first, eyes and mouth wide open. He is in the foreground the entire time the group debates whether to hide the crimes or not, and we cannot stop staring at his face. It's the same with Ronnie Cox's body. He's found downstream. He's wedged between driftwood and rocks with his arm twisted over his head in an unnatural way and his body shattered. He looks like a maiden head on a boat propped in the water with a peaceful expression on his dead face. Horrible beautiful. And then there is the scene where Ed sees a silhouette of a lone figure with a rifle on top of the mountain. They can't be sure if it's the guy who got away after the rape. If he is, the group is trapped. Under the cover of night, Ed climbs up the cliffside to kill the man. He's armed only with a recursive bow. Ed hides until he gets a shot and kills the man. He checks to see if the man is missing the front teeth as assailant did. The man has all of his teeth, but the front ones are dentures. We are left with ambiguity and doubt and guilt. The surviving group members make a pact similar to the one in Peter Straub's ghost story. They dispose of the bodies in the river to be buried forever when a dam floods the area. They will take their secret to their graves. We are treated to one last shock image. We see a lake, presumably where the river used to be. It is eerily quiet. And then a bloated hand breaks the surface of the water. Of course, it's a nightmare sequence, a fake ending, a staple of horror films. There have been a few interpretations of what the allegories of deliverance are. Some say it's a comment on man's disregard for nature, and the hill people represent the forces of nature. Others say it's a comment on the urban man's loss of connection with his masculine primal self. And some say it's a cynical updating of country mouse versus city mouse. I think all of these are valid, 
But I think the real legacy of deliverance is that it tapped into a growing anxiety about the rift between us and them in America, the increasingly violent fight between two different philosophies and beliefs and values, which continues on to this day. And at that moment in history, the perfect stand-in for that rift was the South, We were not far removed from seeing sheriffs in Alabama openly defying federal mandates to end Jim Crow law, or that three civil rights activists from the North were murdered by a sheriff and his deputy when they traveled down to Mississippi. There was a rage building in the South, rage as old as the burning of Atlanta. If you go down there and you're a Yankee, you might just get yourself killed. Deliverance gave voice to what was only whispered in private and cemented the stigma of the killer redneck into popular culture. Deliverance has been called an action-adventure film as well as a drama thriller. It was nominated for Best Picture of 1972. Deliverance also gave birth to Southern Dread films like Making County Line and Whiskey Mountain, and it is the grandfather to the backwoods horror film, which covers films like The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Hills Have Eyes, and Wrong Turn. I'm saying Deliverance is a horror movie. Deliverance reflected back the audience's fears of a violent rift happening in the country and used hillbilly stereotypes as a metaphor. And it was so effective that the movie is still synonymous with backwoods horror. Now, the next movie I want to talk about didn't just reflect the audience's fears, it blew them up to mythic proportions. And it was so effective that it radically changed the template for films of its type. And it even had a significant impact on American culture. That movie is the original Dirty Harry. Yeah, you heard me. I think Dirty Harry is a horror film that isn't considered a horror film. I'll explain my case. First, I get it if you can't see it, because Dirty Harry is synonymous with a cop film, and it was so influential, it's not easy for people to separate the film's influence or its legacy from the actual film itself. And hey, when I first saw the movie in the 1970s, I saw it as just a cop film too. But several years ago, I decided to re-watch Dirty Harry, and there's a scene in there that made me go back and reassess it as a horror movie. Now, before I describe the scene, I'll give the basic plot in case some listeners haven't seen it. However, I do realize if new viewers watch Dirty Harry for the first time now, it might be a little underwhelming for them. Because even if you've never seen Dirty Harry, you've already seen Dirty Harry. What was revolutionary about it has been copied by every edgy cop film since then. Shows like 24 and CSI, or especially The Shield, are direct descendants of Dirty Harry. But except for Sean Ryan's The Shield, they all gloss over the horror that's dead in the center of the first film. First, the plot. Dirty Harry is about a serial killer who terrorizes San Francisco and the maverick rule-breaking inspector out to catch him. Clint Eastwood plays Inspector Harry Callahan. It's the role he was born to play. Andrew Robinson plays Scorpio, the serial killer. He was so good in the role that he received death threats after the movie came out. Scorpio is based on the real-life Zodiac Killer who terrorized San Francisco in the late 60s and early 70s, which means Zodiac was still active at the time of the movie's release. The movie's storyline alternates between Scorpio killing innocent citizens and Inspector Callahan breaking the rules to try and catch him. And then, about an hour into the film, comes the scene I was talking about. This scene comes on the tail end of an extended game of cat and mouse to save a girl that Scorpio has buried alive somewhere in the city. The chase reaches its apex in an empty football stadium that Scorpio lives in. Under the cover of darkness, Harry breaks in without a warrant and he surprises an unarmed Scorpio. They run through the dark and cavernous stadium. The shots are so dark that there are times you need to search the frame to see where the characters are and the chase eventually leads them out onto the football field. At that precise moment, another detective on the scene finds the stadium lights and turns them on. Scorpio is running across the illuminated football field when Harry tells him to stop. The unarmed killer stops and puts his hands up in surrender. And Harry shoots him anyway. 
Scorpio lands hard on the ground, screaming. The soundtrack is suddenly full of tense, discordant music and screams of pain. The camera is at a super low angle with the wounded criminal in the foreground and Harry advances towards him. The framing of this shot is unmistakable to anyone who's seen even a few horror movies. This is a movie monster about to kill a helpless victim who fell in the woods. The shot changes to Harry's point of view, so now we see the moment through Callahan's eyes. We look down at a screaming, bleeding, and terrified Scorpio. He begs for a doctor. He begs for a lawyer. Harry answers the pleas by taking the heel of his shoe and sticking it into the bullet wound in Scorpio's leg. But since we are seeing things through Harry's point of view, it's our heel digging into the wound. Suddenly, the camera rises up and away into the night, away from the bright lights of the football field where Harry stands over his screaming prey. The shot keeps rising up into the night until the football stadium is a little square of light surrounded by darkness. Now, this is a pivotal scene in the movie. Dirty Harry has caught the serial killer. But the way the movie is shot cuts any celebration short. This is some dark shit. It begs the question, if Dirty Harry is our hero, why shoot this like a horror movie? Well, it's a scene that's overtly shot like a horror movie, but Dirty Harry is full of horror movie elements. Because I think director Don Siegel was making a point in this scene, and it was a culmination of points being made since the start of the movie. The more that Dirty Harry breaks the rules to get to his prey, the more he's like his prey. He steps over the line between good and evil, and he is being transformed. And the entire reason for the movie even existing is the battle between good and evil. Is Harry the symbol of good in this story? Well, he's the only effective symbol of good in the movie. Everything else fails. What does it say about a civilized society when our heroes act just like our bad guys? What does it say about us if that's what we demand of them? Now, Don Siegel was a conservative, and I have no doubt he felt a lot of people just needed a swift kick in the ass in 1971. But I think he was aware that this movie's content was volatile. And he used the horror movie to voice concerns about a slippery slope. Now, you might disagree with my reading, and I welcome alternate translations. What do you think is the significance of the camera rising into the darkness while the two men are frozen in the moment Harry steps on the wound? It's a technically complex shot. They needed a helicopter to be able to go high enough to get what Don Siegel wanted. I think it shows that this is the moment that Harry goes down the rabbit hole and his transformation to the evil side is complete. Now, Don Siegel had been making movies since the 1940s. He made crime movies, prison movies, and westerns. He also made the original Invasion of the Body Snatchers. So it's safe to say he knew what he was doing and that he understood film language. In other words, he knew that what you show and how you show it affects the story and the emotions that people will feel. I say that because the choices that Siegel makes through the film point to a horror movie. There's lots of questions to ask about the choices. Like, why does so much of this film take place at night? I didn't use a stopwatch, but I'll bet 75% of Dirty Harry happens at night. But it's not just night being night. The city is shown differently at night. During the day, it's your standard picturesque San Francisco. At night, it's all back alleys and tunnels and quarries and red light districts. Don Siegel keeps the alleys and parks so dark you can't see what's in them. Sometimes the whole frame goes dark, so we can only listen. But more importantly, and telling, there's a difference in how Harry is perceived and how he acts between day and night. In daylight, everything is pretty clear. At night, not so much. The first shot we see in the movie takes place in broad daylight, and it is meant to give us a sense of dread we see the huge barrel of a sniper rifle pointed right at the audience. It moves back and forth. Everyone is in the crosshairs. 
This is how we are introduced to Scorpio. We really don't need anything more, which is good because all we learn about him is that he sleeps in the groundskeeping shed at Kizar Stadium, he owns a 30-odd six, and he wants to kill. We never get a motivation. He just is. We're introduced to Harry in broad daylight as well. He enters the crime scene on the roof alone. He's not ignored by the police officers, but nobody questions what he's doing there. But the real introduction to Dirty Harry is the famous Feel Lucky Punk moment, which also takes place in broad daylight. He's in plain clothes and eating a hot dog when he blows away some bank robbers on a crowded city street. They shot first, of course. But nobody, not the bystanders or the responding police officers, think he's anything but a cop. He is in full hero mode. As for character development, we don't learn a lot about Dirty Harry either. About all we know is that he hates everybody equally and he uses every racial slur to prove it. He has a reputation. A doctor jokes about not telling him how to beat a confession out of a criminal. Ha ha. He had a wife who died in a car accident. And he eats the same thing for lunch and dinner, a hot dog. There's almost as much character development for his gun. It's a 44 Magnum, the most powerful handgun in the world and will blow your head clean off. But with all of that, we can accept Harry as the force of good, flawed or not, especially in contrast with Scorpio. The two main characters couldn't be more different in the light of day, and you know exactly what they're all about during the daylight scenes. The nighttime, well, that's a different story. Don Siegel makes a big contrast between the two characters during the day, which is the first 20 minutes of the movie. But as night starts to take over the movie, he starts showing the similarities between the two. There's a scene where Dirty Harry is following a suspect into a dark alley. A light goes on in a window, and he gets up on a trash can to look in. He sees a woman ready to take off her top, and he keeps watching. Suddenly, he gets beaten up by a bunch of men who think he's a peeping Tom. He is. Harry's partner shows up to arrest the men for assaulting a police officer. The men are incredulous. They can't believe he's a cop. And yet, this is the same guy whose authority nobody questioned in the daylight. And that's not the only time Harry is seen as a voyeur. Harry and Mrs. Scorpio enter a trap the police have set at night because he starts spying on a naked woman with his binoculars. Why are these scenes in the movie? They're making Harry look creepy. In the dark, he is susceptible to temptation. And we see the same with Scorpio. He's also a voyeur. They are both predatory. Siegel starts showing similarities in a visual way as well. He repeats shots with both characters standing in the same place at different times. At night, Harry nearly runs over two people and he yells at them for being in the way. And then he goes to the red light district and Harry says they should throw a net over all of them. Who is he a police officer for? Harry and Scorpio both think very little of the people of San Francisco. Now, just like John Borman did in Deliverance, Siegel creates a distorted nightmare world to exploit the anxieties of the audience. And the anxiety that was most exploited was the fear that the system had completely failed. The police let Scorpio get away again and again. The only effective officer of the law is Harry. This world is stacked, so Harry is the only viable answer. But then, why does Siegel keep showing Harry and Scorpio as similar? Why the horror sequence on the football field? Why is it important that his partner and other officers get shot when Harry goes outside the box of the law? It's interesting that Scorpio doesn't change from minute one until minute 102 in the movie. He's a stand-in for evil. And Harry is a stand-in as well. He is our id with a badge. And Harry is the one who changes in the film. You can say he walks over the line between good and evil, but he's the symbol of law and justice. He is the line between good and evil, our line. And the line just got moved. And such an action comes with a price. And this horror movie has a transformation sequence. This is a night sequence that lasts nearly 25 minutes of the movie's running time and ends with a climax in the football stadium. 
A girl has been buried in the city, and Harry is the bagman for the ransom, and he is sent running across town by Scorpio. The film gets progressively darker the deeper Harry goes on this quest, and the camera angles get more tilted and surreal. It's at the foot of a gigantic cross on Mount Davidson that Harry and Scorpio first meet in person. Scorpio forces Harry to face the cross, put his nose right on it. He then beats Callahan to the ground and viciously kicks his ribs in. Harry is losing consciousness, but Scorpio wants him awake when he kills him. And when Scorpio hesitates, Callahan stabs the man in the leg. He screams. Scorpio tumbles hard down a hill. And this starts the transformation. Don Siegel cuts back and forth to both men, lying motionless on the ground, momentarily unconscious. Then... They both stir at the same time, and the camera cuts back and forth between them. Then we see them both trying desperately to regain consciousness. They both roll to their sides. The camera keeps cutting back and forth between the men struggling to get up. They are mirroring each other's moves. Scorpio gets away, but something has happened to Harry in the violence this fight between good and evil, something transferred between them. And Harry is the one who was changed. Where Harry killed only armed bank robbers who shot first in the daylight, now he shoots an unarmed man who has surrendered. Harry wins nothing by moving the line. The things he does above the law allow Scorpio to go free. Where Harry was cool and in control enough to insult the mayor and not get suspended in the daylight, Harry is now yelling that the law is wrong. Why is all of this happening if Harry's way was the only right choice? Now, Harry is always in the darkness, even during the daylight. We follow Scorpio as he limps around in alleged freedom. But everywhere he goes, Dirty Harry is there, in the crowd, staring at him from behind dark sunglasses and smiling. Harry starts popping up like a phantom, like Michael Myers in the backyards. In the inevitable finale, Scorpio can't take it anymore, and he kidnaps a bus full of children and intends to escape on a plane. And when the bus turns off the freeway into a desolate valley full of quarries outside of the city, Dirty Harry is there, standing on a railroad bridge over the road, alone, waiting like the angel of death. In the final moments, Dirty Harry points his 44 Magnum down at Scorpio, just like he did early in the film for the feel-lucky-punk moment. In fact, this is a replaying of that scene. Back in the daylight, before the long darkness that transformed Harry into another version of the monster, he said those famous words with calm and confidence and a cocky smile. He was in control then. He knew exactly who he was and who the bank robber was. There was a clear line between the two of them. There was a badge. Now his voice shakes with emotion. His eyes tear up from the rage. He pulls the trigger. There is no line. There is no badge. He threw it into the lake. Dirty Harry went on to become a huge success commercially, spawning four sequels. It's in the National Film Registry in the Library of Congress. In AFI's 100 Years, 100 Heroes and Villains list, the character Harry Callahan ranks number 17 on the heroes list. And the movie tapped into the growing frustration and anger in the country over increasing urban crime. The character of Dirty Harry became a symbol for a growing voice of change that demanded a tougher stance on crime. This translated into the character being adopted into political discussion like a folk hero. Even though Dirty Harry is an expression of pure id. And what of that line between good and evil? What happens to us when we move that line to suit us, even if it's for a greater good? Well, I mentioned the first time viewer of Dirty Harry, right? Would they find the movie quaint now? Might they watch it and say... What's the big deal? And therein lies the horror.
Thanks for listening to my show. I'd love to hear back from you. You can email me directly at scott at hellbentforhorror.com. For you, the listeners of Hellbent for Horror, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash hellbentforhorror. If you like the show and you're curious about audiobooks, sign up for the service through Hellbent for Horror. It helps make this podcast sustainable for me, and I thank you in advance. And thanks for listening. Hellbent for Horror was written and broadcast by me, S.A. Bradley, and produced by me and Lisa Gorski. If you like the show, please consider writing a review on iTunes or Google Play. It really helps. Thanks a lot for listening. You can now subscribe to the Hellbent for Horror podcast. It's now available on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. You can also keep up with Hellbent for Horror on iTunes at iTunes Podcast. That's on Twitter. You can find more on our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Hellbent for Horror, and I'm on Twitter at Hellbent Horror. You can also find more info on my website, hellbentforhorror.com. Till next time, stay hellbent.